Hi everyone, this is Elon Gerno here at the Ayn Rand Institute. I'm really excited today to be speaking to one of the contributors of this book, Foundations of a Free Society, Reflections on Ayn Rand's Political Philosophy. This is a, an outstanding book uh, that takes a deep look into Ayn Rand's argument and justification for capitalism, for which she's really famous. And it's a, it's a insightful and, and um, penetrating book Many of the art, uh, chapters in here um, engage with intellectual debates that are out in, in academia and among scholars, and it helped position Ayn Rand's view within uh, other uh, sort of the arguments out there and, and relative to other thinkers. Uh, today, I, I have the pleasure of speaking with one of the contributors, Rob Tarr, who has contributed a chapter on the economic side of the argument. So capitalism is, is both a, it's a social system, so it's broader than just the political scene, obviously, and, and many people recognize it as a primarily an economic system. So let me introduce you, Rob, and then we can get into a bit about your chapter. So hi, how are you, Rob? Good, how's it going, Elon? Good, thanks for joining me today. I thought maybe the way to start is just, if you could tell us a little bit about your background and how you got into writing about economic issues. Um, sure. I guess, uh, you know, going back to my young teenage years, I had three major influences. I had a, uh, an uncle who was into free market economics, and he gave me Milton Friedman's Free to Choose and uh, Von Mises' Human Action to read, actually. Um, so that led to a lifelong interest in economics. Um, around the same time, I read a couple of popular books on investing. This was back in the early 80s, where interest rates were 18%, and inflation was 14%, and crises, macroeconomic crises. Um, so these were a couple of books written by libertarians, actually. I didn't know at the time, but it was Doug Casey and Harry Brown. Um, and so that got me hooked on economics, or uh, sorry, on investing. Um, but they were also talking about business cycle theory in those investing books, which I didn't know at the time was actually about Mises' business cycle theory. Um, but I got very interested in business cycle theory as a result, too, just thinking that that could be a potential way to help investing and make money as well. Um, also, at the same time, I, I, a friend gave me up a shrug to read, so I became passionate about uh, philosophy as well. Um, and so those have sort of been the three main tracks that I've followed ever since then. Um, at one point, I was going to go to academia. I, I uh, did graduate work in philosophy. Um, I started doing a PhD in economics. Uh, then I got hired away to the hedge fund world. So I went to work in Bermuda for an uh, offshore hedge fund. Um, I was there for about 15 years uh, as a portfolio manager. Um, was managing a group of about 14 people, uh, ultimately. Um, when 2008 came around, it was sort of the peak of the housing bubble, the culmination of the housing bubble. And there were some things going on, like Bear Stearns went bankrupt and so on. And that, uh, I kind of saw the right on the wall, but this looked like this was about to all come to a head and, and come to a crash. Um, at that point, I decided to retire from the hedge fund industry and pursue my intellectual interests more. Uh, particularly at that time, business cycle theory, because I wanted to watch the crisis unfold real time and live and be able to study it full time. Um, and then since then, the last 10 years or so, I've basically been pursuing you know, largely intellectual interests, so doing my own research in economics and philosophy. Um, I guess I, one life goal I'd always had was to try to figure out the proper philosophic base for economics. Um, and this chapter is sort of the culmination of that line of thinking, I guess you could say. So let's, uh, let's pick up from there, because um, so I have my old beaten up copy of this book, which I'm sure you, you kind of... Oh yeah, yep. <laughs> so this is Capitalism, the Unknown Ideal by Ayn Rand, yeah. and it was formative in my thinking, uh, in my interest in, in um, Ayn Rand's thought on capitalism. This is sort of the entry point for me. And, you know, for people who haven't read this book, can you help us understand, well, why does she subtitle it as Unknown Ideal? Because well, for people, it's like we live in a capitalist system. What? What? This is sort of is this ironic? Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, I think that's a very important point. I think most people miss that about the title of the book. Actually, um, you know, most people realize that Ayn Rand thought capitalism was an ideal, uh, but what they miss was she's stressing that's an unknown ideal. So it's it's not that people know about it and then they reject it. For example, uh, what she's saying is people don't even really know what it is, what its nature is, how it functions, what is what it depends on. Um, so she wrote the book, in essence, to try to make it now. She, she explicitly says her purpose is, I want to show what capitalism is, what its nature is, uh, and most specifically what philosophic principles it rests upon. So it was her view that, um, well, I guess to back up a step, as you said, she viewed it as a social system. Um, most people view it as an economic system. And to her, a social system, she defines it as a, um, 
the, I forget the exact word, but it was, it's a set of moral, political, and economic principles. And that's hyphenated, so she sees that as a unity. So it's moral, political, economic principles that are embodied in the institutions of society. So she views capitalism as a social system, and she views it that you can talk about the economic aspect of capitalism, but it's always in the context that this is a social system. That's one aspect of a full social system. So it's always in the context of these deeper moral and political principles that are that are part of it. So you can't talk about economics apart from you know all those other principles. Um, so you know, in terms of what she thought needed to be understood, I guess the two things she raises most importantly, she says that uh, it depends on a certain view of man, on the metaphysical nature of man, um, and it depends on a certain conception of value. So you need to understand. Uh, well, I guess she had her, her own unique conception of value, um, but you need to understand or, uh, uh, every social system is based on a certain conception of value, and so it's important to understand what conception of value capitalism is based upon. Now, you, so part of her project in the book is to defend capitalism, and you are saying that part of what interested you is sort of the philosophical basis for capitalism. So what, so in, in a sentence or two, what would you say is her case for what is the philosophic foundations of her view or her argument? Um, sure, and I guess I, I focus in my chapter mostly on the uh, conception of value. Um, so, let's see. It was basically, she, she thought there were three basic conceptions of value. So there's the intrinsic conception, the subjective conception, and the objective conception of value. Um, she, you know, mainstream thinkers tend to recognize intrinsic value and subjective value. So they see that as a dichotomy, that either value inheres in things in reality, apart from anybody valuing them, or that value just comes from somebody's consciousness just liking something, and then there's a value to them subjectively, just because they like it. Other people might not, it's not a value to them. Um, she defined a third category, which she called objective, and um, that was the category that she thinks is what capitalism depends on. Uh, and there's, there's even a quote she says uh, in What is Capitalism? She says, um, again, I may not get the wording exactly right, but it's something to the effect that uh, capitalism is the only system implicitly based on a rejective theory of values and the historic tragedies that this has never been recognized. So part of what she's trying to do is to make that recognized, is to say, you know, here's this new category of value. This is what capitalism embodies. And that's why capitalism is good. So just to dive into your, your chapter in this book. So your title is Economic Theory and Conceptions of Value. Uh, you know, so I, I'm certainly not an economist, so, and many of the people listening are not. So how would you summarize sort of what, what is the main claim you're making and then what is the basic point you present? Sure. Uh, you're basically, I guess, my main argument is I'm, I'm arguing that uh, First of all, that every school of economics does have an implicit or explicit conception of value uh, that it rests upon. And um, even deeper than that, I'm claiming that whatever that conception of value is, that's what fundamentally shapes mm. the entire economic theory. Um, so it's not just like a platform that it sits upon and then you know, it does its own thing. It's like, no, that, that conception of value infuses and shapes everything about a particular theory of economics. Um, and then what I, what I do is I take each of the three categories that I ran to find, so the intrinsic, subjective, and objective, and then I show with three major schools of economics how they rest on, you know, I take the classical school of economics and show how it rests on intrinsic value and how that infuses and defines everything about classical economics. Um, how the neoclassical school depends on a subjective conception of value and how that, you know, shapes neoclassical economics. Um, and then probably most controversially, I argue that the Austrian school depends on an objective conception of value in Ayn Rand's sense of objective. Um, and I mean, it's controversial because the Austrians call themselves subjective value theorists. Uh, but then there's a whole confusion about what those terms, you know, as I mentioned, mainstream thinkers think is only intrinsic or subjective. Um, but the intrinsic, they call objective. <laughs> so, <laughs> let's, get, let's get to that in a second, but I, I want to just say, so let's see if I, if, I'm, if I can summarize what I'm taking away from your summary of the, the chapter and, and from reading it, it's, is it fair to say then that you're arguing that these economic theories themselves 
are resting on. So when you say a conception of value, that's a theoretical philosophic conception of value. Right. Right. Okay. And that seems to me that in itself seems fairly controversial because economists, they, they, from the ones I've talked to, economics is a way of thinking and it sort of stands in for, I think they would be surprised to hear that they have some philosophic premises. Yes, I think that's true. Yeah. Um, and there's a whole, um, I don't want to say strain, it's more just uh, consensus even, I would say, in economics that, uh, that economics is value free. Um, and so the, the goal is, the idea is that they think economics needs to be a science, a hard science. And if you bring in values, they mm. think, well, that, that it kind of goes into philosophy and that's, you know, that's not a hard science. And uh, um, so they want to, in a sense, kind of corral off economics and protect it from values so that they can claim that it's a hard science. Um, but what I argue is you can't do that. that there's always some implicit conception of value. And I think the value-free people often they're implicitly assuming the subject of conception of value, um, not necessarily even realizing it. Um, and uh, yeah, so whether they realize it or not, whatever they're assuming implicitly, that's shaping their economic theory and blinding them to other approaches to economics. So you mentioned the three schools of economic thinking that you discuss in the chapter. So let's just take them one at a time. And so there's the classical neoclassical and the Austrian. And so maybe for each of them, can you tell us who are one or two figures that we are associated with that school and that people might have heard of? Sure. Um, well, with the classical school, I mean, probably the canonical figure is Adam Smith, um, generally considered the founder of economics as a science. He was the first one to take a, a lot of disparate, isolated generalizations about economics and pull them together into a theoretical systematic account of the subject matter. And so that was you're really the first to show that you can think theoretically and systematically about economics. So, um, so he'd be the main figure in classical. Other key figures are David Ricardo, John Stuart Mill. Um, Karl Marx is kind of the dead end of classical economics. Um, he takes the intrinsic labor theory value to its logical extreme and then, you know, that's it. it it's, and that's at the time that classical economics is starting to morph into neoclassical economics. Um, uh, neoclassical economics started actually with a new conception of economic value. So it was an explicit shift from an intrinsic theory of value to what they call the subjective uh, conception of value. Um, so the two key figures there were, uh, for the neoclassical school, were uh, William Stanley Jevons and Leon Balra. So they were the ones who came up with this new conception of subjective value. Um, a third is Karl Menger, who had a a uh, parallel conception of value around the same time. So all three of them are considered the fathers of modern economics in a sense of, of the, they call it the marginal revolution because they came up with a marginal conception of value. Um, but I, I argue that Megger is actually different from Balra and, uh, and Jevons. So, um, so in the neoclassical school, you know, another key figure is Alfred Marshall. Um, you know, then there's just a long string of economists up to the present day that, uh, I mean, you could just pick dozens of, of leading representatives. Um, for the Austrian school, I mentioned Karl Menger, so he was the one who launched the Austrian school with a new conception of value. Um, and then, you know, key figures after him were uh, Ludwig von Mises, uh, Friedrich Hayek, um, and up to the current date, I would, Israel Kirzner is probably the, the uh, greatest living Austrian economist. So this is maybe this is going to be the most challenging part of the interview for me uh, because in, in your chapter um, you you explain I think really well the what each of these so this is the Ayn, Ayn Rand's trichotomy of intrinsic subjective and, and her conception of objective yeah. and so maybe you can help with sort of for each of these maybe you can map it onto its conception of value what what does that look like in the way they think about the economy or what's an example of the way this plays out? Sure. Um, the, the classical economists, they, so they start with an intrinsic theory of value. So they think that value inheres in the goods. Um, so if you have some object, it just, it's inherently valuable, intrinsically valuable. So what, what gives it its value originally? Because like if, if I have a, like a, a cart for my farm, what, 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 how do I figure out its value? Right, well, that's a good question. So for them, the value comes from the inputs that are that go into making it up. So they trace back, okay, well, this is valuable. That's because the things that were used to make it are valuable. And then ultimately, they'll trace it back to things like labor. So 
not not only labor, but you know, the labor theory of value is the key uh, aspect or element of intrinsic value. So they'll say labor is intrinsically valuable, and that's what gives value to each of these objects, and then those are used as inputs to a final product, and so on. And so, and once you have product, it's just intrinsically valuable. So uh, they don't connect it to the um, the value that a subject, that a person, puts on the object. Um, so in terms of how that shapes their their theory, um, you know, it 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 gives a very distinct view of what production is all about. Um, so for them, production really is transforming inputs into outputs. And there's not really room for a thought process there, not a goal-directed thought process. Um, and then you know, this will come up clear with the Austrians and, and Iran. Um, for, for the Austrians and Iran, their theory of production is that, or the concept of production, is that it relies on a goal-directed thought process. So it's a creative thought process of coming up with a new goal and then creatively thinking of a plan of how to achieve that goal. And that's what identifies value. That's where, that's the crux of producing value. Um, that's not really, they don't really have that in the classical conception of production. Um, it, so that's just sort of ignored and left by the side. And there's, there's a result. Uh, you know, classical economics is fairly early on. So they're, you know, they didn't really have a theory of the entrepreneur, but they didn't really have a lot of things because they're still trying to refine and flesh out certain categories. Um, you know, they couldn't, they didn't really have a good theory of profits because, you know, if all the value is inherent in the physical objects, then, you know, if somebody's skimming off some profits, well, you must be taking something from somebody. So they get the, the whole Marxian idea of exploitation of the workers and so on. Um, so it does go wrong in that, in that sense. Um, and uh, as well, they take an aggregate perspective on the economy. So uh, you know, the very title of Adam Smith's book was The Wealth of Nations, and that's what he was concerned about is, you know, what causes the wealth of nations so in the, on this aggregate level. So say, say a bit more about that, because I, I remember in your chapter, this is a, a key point that connects with Ayn Rand's conception. So when you say aggregate or nation, so that means all the people in some area, and that's how we're going to think about evaluating the economy and different elements of it, as opposed to what? Uh, well, that's a good question. As opposed to, you know, and this took me a long time to understand myself, which, um, is what does it mean to take an individualistic perspective on economics? Um, you know, there's a passage in What is Capitalism where Ayn Rand, she talks about mainstream economists and she said, um, you know, because they have this aggregate perspective, she called it a tribal perspective, and they're infused with this. And she said they have this, this strange double standard where if they look at a shoemaker as an as a individual person, they can say, oh yeah, you know, he's making a living as a shoemaker. Um, whereas if they look at him as an economist, like from the lens of an economist, they think, oh, you know, he's serving the function of providing shoes for society and so on. Um, and uh, I mean, I never really knew what to do with that. I wasn't sure why that was wrong or you know, why that's a double perspective or how would you, you know, the shoemaker making a living, how would that fit into economics? How would you have an economic theory based on that? Um, but what I came to understand about her and about the Austrians is that they really do make it about the individual trying to produce in the context of the division of labor. So he's not just producing for himself, he's producing for other people. And so he needs to know, well, what do they value and what, what do I need to do to produce value? Um, given that it's not for me, that it's for other people who are gonna value and use it. Um, and so economics explains how that takes place. So how the price system gives rise to, in von Mises terms, economic calculation. And that allows the shoemaker to decide or figure out what to produce. So you know, it's not just a technical matter if he has to combine leather and uh, you know, nails and so on to make shoes. He has to figure out how to do that profitably. So he has to figure out how to combine everything and make a product that he can sell at a profit, which he does by economic calculation with the, uh, with the price system. So the whole perspective is for both von Mises and for Ayn Rand, it's you know, how do I as an individual produce? How do I produce value? And then economics is explaining the whole all the principles that underlie that. So, so you, that, that's helpful. Now, but why wouldn't you call that subjective? So isn't it because you, you said there's a third conception of value and that's aligned with more the neoclassical approach. So, so yeah. distinguish that for us. Yeah, well, I guess uh, going back to Ayn Rand's conception of objective value. Um, yeah, well, sorry, let's start with subject value. Yeah. The subject value manifests in economics as it's just consumer preferences, subjective consumer preferences. So consumers just happen to like or dislike 
some products versus other products and so on. And that's where value comes in. So they think if that's the only point where value comes into uh, economic theory. Um, so for example, if you're able to sell something, that's proof that there's some value in it. Is that a fair? Uh, that's right. Yeah, and, and it, 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 it shapes what economics is even supposed to explain. So, um, you know, because it's subjective consumer preference, it just comes from we don't know where, and, and economists don't even care. It's just, well, for whatever reason, consumers like that. So that's exogenous to economics. That's outside of economics. We take that as given, and then we just reason from there. So we try to figure out, given they value that, you know, let's impute prices to products, impute prices to inputs, and so on. Um, but uh, so there's there's no um, there's no element of value permeating production. So what happens with the neoclassicals is that production just becomes a matter of scientific and technological uh, knowledge. So it's just scientists and engineers come up with a product, and then consumers either like it or dislike it, and that's it. So you have so you have value, subjective value, without any element of knowledge or uh, so on. And you have uh, production of goods, but without any value element. So it's just that scientifically and technologically, we just have those products. Um, now what von Mises has argued is uh, that it's not, production cannot be just a purely scientific and technological matter. Um, it's not just a factual matter, but it's actually a crucial value matter. Um, and this was his famous argument, uh, the impossibility of economic calculation under socialism. Um, so he said it's got to be a marriage, it's got to be an integration of factual thinking and evaluative thinking to decide, uh, you know, this is a product that we should make, or this is a goal that we're going to make this kind of product. Not just because it's technologically feasible, but because we, we see the value of this, we see that this will, this will produce value. Um, so, uh, um, yeah, so that, it, that's basically bringing in an objective conception of value. So. Stepping back to Ayn Rand's conception of value, um, you know, for her, what makes something an object of value is, first of all, value is a goal. So it's some vision you have of something you want to realize. Um, it's some, uh, and that becomes a problem that you need to solve. So you have some vision, okay, I, I want to do this, or I think this would be the right thing for my life. Uh, and then, then it becomes a problem to solve, and you have to do the evaluative thinking of, well, what's going to get me there? So what means do I need to bring together and integrate in order to achieve that goal? Um, and all that sort of thinking is what I call goal-directed thinking, which is distinct from factual thinking. So it's not just, you know, let me figure out what's true, what the facts are, or, you know, some scientific facts or technological facts, but it's how do I arrange means and ends in order to get this vision or this, this product that I, that I want to produce? Um, so that is the crux of her objective conception of value is that there's this kind of evaluative thinking constantly going on. Um, that's the crux of von Mises economic calculation argument is that it's not just factual thinking, it's you need this evaluative thinking of figuring out how to integrate means in order to achieve a conceived goal. Um, and uh, you know, then economics has to be centered on that process of goal directed thinking. So for von Mises, that's the heart of economics is that that's what production is, is this kind of goal-directed thinking. And similarly for Ayn Rand, that's her conception of production is, you know, it's this kind of thinking, um, you know, to you know, conceiving goals and creatively forming plans, that's the root of creating value, that's the root of production. I want to circle back to um, Atlas Shrugged. So for people who haven't read the book, I, I'm not going to give any spoilers away, but one of the I mean, the, the core of the story centers on the collapse of a society and particularly its economic collapse. And it's, and as you were describing sort of the views of the, these different schools of economic thought, it, it occurred to me, um, you know, well, paraphrasing them sounds like some of the characters in the story of Atlas Shrugged where we don't, we don't care how this is, uh, how these trains are going to run. They're just here and we just, it's just a technical problem of making them operate. Or there's the other view of, well, there's inherent value in my labor. And so how, you know, in my being a worker, so the, you know, let's decide with the workers. I, and then the contrast is with Rand's conception that you get through, throughout the book, um, which is, I mean, it, it, her, she has this real focus on the mind of producers. And that was sort of ringing in my ears as I was listening to you. Okay. 
Yes, definitely. And I think the key is this 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 uh, issue of goal directed thinking. So, um, it, you know, people focus on the scientific and technological thinking that goes into a product, but they don't realize that that's not enough. You you need the goal directed thinking to you know, often even to conceive a product. So, like, why did they even decide to scientifically and technologically focus on that kind of product? Well, it's because somebody conceived a goal and said this would be good. You know, not just that this is possible, but this would be a good thing. And we should try to solve this problem to produce this rather than you know 25 other things that we could technically feasibly do but you know somebody had to make the value decision of no this is what is really worth trying to produce um now if you don't have that recognition of that kind of thought process that goal directed thought process which i think that's the crux of evaluation that's what valuing is is conceiving goals and then you're creatively thinking how to integrate means in order to achieve the goal. Um, if you don't see that as the crux of production and the crux of creating value, then you're necessarily going to think that it's just a matter of, that it's somehow inherent in the inputs. Mm -hmm. So the classical school, you know, so they, they tended to view inputs as just being intrinsically productive. So they just have this inherent productive power. And often they'll even say that. They'll say, oh, you know, these, these inputs have inherent productive power. And that's why you know, they transmit their intrinsic value into the output, so then the output has intrinsic value, and so on. Um, and that's very much the kind of thing that, as you were saying, and not the short, that's the kind of thing that Ayn Rand illustrates and dramatizes, is people have that view as if, it, oh, if I just have this factory, it will automatically be productive for me. Um, or if I just have this motor or this engine or whatever, it will just automatically, you know, because it's inherent, it's just inherently productive. Uh, but then what she shows is that, no, it comes from, the minds of the great business people who you know they're the ones who know what to do with it because they're the ones who have goals they're the ones who are constantly thinking of well you know how you know, what's the pathway to get to that goal how do i you know, what do i need what do i do how do i get there um you know it's not just a matter of having it something you know, having a factory and just turning the cranks and you know everything just automatically happens and boom you've got a product turned out um, i mean you could you get a physical product turned out um you know that could be semi-automatic is that you know you just turn the cranks to the physical product but is that valuable? You know, that's you know, what's the valuable thing to do? That's what's missing. That's what the that's what she's trying to illustrate with uh, with Tyler Schreck. So I want to uh, bring out a point that you make in the essay that the these other so when you look at these schools of thought in economics, you you suggest I guess you 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 argue and I think you do show this that the the classical and neoclassical approaches they they fall short in explaining actual phenomena in the world. Like if you're looking at the economy, if you're thinking about, you know, the, you know, what comes to mind is the, you know, the blossoming of technology in Silicon Valley and all these startups and, and this whole ethos of people sitting down and thinking, well, how can we build the next app? What's the next, next thing? And, and so your argument is that the other approaches in economics, because of their economic, the conception of economic value, they can't explain the entrepreneurial, activity and they can't explain competition within an industry or across. So just maybe you can dramatize that for us a bit. How, how does that look sure. like? Sure. Um, I guess the central analytical framework for neoclassical economics is the equilibrium framework. Um, so they want to figure out what are the prices and quantities of everything at equilibrium. So you know, when supply equals demand across every product in every field, um, you know, what are the prices and quantities uh, that are realized in equilibrium? Um, and uh, you know, that really just drops out this whole issue of goal-directed thinking. So you know, somebody conceiving something new and then conceiving new plans to achieve it. Well, in equilibrium, everything is known and given. And they explicitly say that. They say, okay, well, we know all the technology is given and so on. Um, and we know all the values of consumers. And so now we're just matching them up. We're just you know, running the matrix to optimize what prices and quantities would result from that. Um, so uh, ironically, what happens is value drops out of economics because that comes from the consumer and that's given. Um, production drops out of economics because that's just a scientific and technological matter. It's not a value matter. Um, and then economics is just about, well, running the optimization until you figure out the equilibrium values for things. Um, so, you know, key features that drop out, well, the entrepreneur, you know, in Ayn Rand's view and in Von Mises' view, the entrepreneur is the person who quintessentially engages in this kind of goal-directed thinking. So it's quintessentially the entrepreneur who comes up with new goals, you know, conceives new visions of 
you know, it would be cool to have this, or it would be great, it would be really helpful to you know, have this product or this service or, or whatever. Um, and then this entrepreneur figures out how to achieve it and says, okay, well, here's the vision. How do we do that? And then you know, the trial and error and the brainstorming and the uh, you know, creative thinking and so on. Um, so that's all goal-directed thinking of, of uh, finding means to achieve a conceived end. Um, now in equilibrium, the neoclassical framework, there's nothing to discover because it's all discovered, it's given. It's just, you know, so there might be a change in technology, but then you just assume a new change in technology and then you just run the optimization again and then you know, boom, you're done. So there's no room for the entrepreneur to really do anything. And, uh, you know, what's interesting is that they actually know that. Um, you know, many new classical economists will explicitly say, well, you know, we can't really account for the entrepreneur. We don't have a way within our analytical framework to give a theoretical explanation of what he is or what he does. You know, so we know real world, you know, this is the kind of thing he does, but we just can't capture that in our models. Um, and you know, this has been going on for 40, 50 years. So they've been trying to do that, but they, they fail. There was a paper in 2005 where basically says, even now we still can't. It was the, the title of the paper is Neoclassical Econo Economics Entrepreneurless. And the answer is yes, it still is. So. <laughs> um, you know, another key feature of capitalism is uh, profits, the profit motive. Um, you know, again, in equilibrium, there's not really any entrepreneurial profits. There's interest on capital, um, but there's not entrepreneurial profits where, you know, you, you come up with a new product, you pull business away from other people, you make huge profits because it's this incredible new valuable product and so on. Um, there's, that doesn't fit into an equilibrium framework. Um, so you know, basically all entrepreneurial profits are competed away by the time you're at equilibrium. So everything is known and given. So all ideas are known and anybody can produce them. And so there's really no... But so you're, sorry, just to interrupt. So you're saying that their theoretical position is that people be acting in the market have perfect knowledge of this at the equilibrium point? Uh, yes, yes. And I mean, in a sense, it's where the economist has perfect knowledge, uh -huh. of it out, but then in order to figure out the equilibrium, but it, but it really does mean that, yeah, that everybody has perfect knowledge of, you know, what to produce, what's the best way to produce it, and so on. Um, and then that's how you calculate the equilibrium values. Um, so since there's no room for the entrepreneur to do anything new or discover anything new, there's no room for entrepreneurial profits, uh, just interest on capital. Um, so then it, you know, what that leads to is, well, the, the, the real world cash value of that is that, well, since they can't account for entrepreneurial profits and they can't account for the entrepreneur, um, profits become kind of suspect. Mm -hmm. um, did they really deserve that? Are they exploiting somebody? Where did that come from? And they can't say where it came from because you know, in von Mises' theory and Ayn Rand's view, it comes from entrepreneurial goal-directed thinking. That's the root activity that gives rise to profits. And that's why the entrepreneur deserves his profits. Uh, for neoclassicals, they, they don't know where it comes from. They can't account for it. So, you know, it's, as I said, it becomes suspect of what's, where does it come from and who really deserves it? Is it, is it somebody ripping somebody off or what is it exactly? Um, and then I guess the third thing that I that I cover in the essay is uh, the issue of competition, which is you know, obviously that's a clear feature of capitalism as well, of real world capitalism. Um, and uh, for Ayn Rand and von Mises, they would think of competition in terms of competition for this creative goal directed thinking. So it's competition in terms of creative achievement, in terms of coming up with new ideas and new value, uh, basically. Um, but you know, again, at equilibrium, in the equilibrium framework, there's no entrepreneurs, there's no new discoveries and so on. Uh, so there obviously cannot be competition in terms of new discoveries. So, um, but they know that there's such a thing as competition, so they need to fit that into the models somehow. So they try to reconceptualize it as something different. And uh, the way they conceptualize it ends up being the opposite of what we normally think of as competition. So it's actually a situation where there's really no competition. Um, and then they call that perfect competition. So, uh, so, so help, help me understand what that means. Sure. So what, why, what is perfect competition? What, what is, so let's take the market for um, operating systems, Mac and, and Windows and, and I guess Linux and others. So what does perfect. perfect competition look like for them? Yeah, uh, well, perfect competition, they have, they have very defined criteria for what constitutes perfect competition. So it has to be um, a wide number of sellers each so small that none of them can influence the price. So, you know, basically, because, you know, so there's a hundred different producers of a product 
none of them could raise the price because then everybody would just go to their competitors. Um, and you know, as I mentioned, there's no new discoveries, no new uh, creative thought processes and so on. So they're all producing the same thing. So a uniform product and that are each too small to influence the market or raise prices. So in a sense, they all the perfect competition because nobody can take business away from anybody else at that point. But that sounds like it, it opens the door to, if you were you know, a, a, a kind of a statist oriented mentality and you wanted to ensure perfect competition, then there would be an opening for regulation to make sure nobody gets too big or too, their product is differentiated too much. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, and it's exactly that kind of theory and that kind of thinking that underlies a lot of antitrust laws today. Um, and a lot of the antitrust prosecutions today, too, is that um, if they think two companies are combining will be too big relative to the market or have too much market power, you know, that's a basis for uh, the antitrust department to, to deny it. And, and you know, just as an aside, it's, it's almost comical how narrow this gets sometimes. So I, there was one merger between uh, two ice cream companies, it was like Breyers and uh, I forget the other one. And uh, you know, this was denied because they would get too big, not in the ice cream market, not in the premium ice cream market, but they would be too big in the super premium segment of the ice cream market and have too much market power. So therefore merger denied. So the definition of a market itself becomes increasingly specialized for this. Exactly, okay. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. so, our, so Sorry, go ahead. And arbitrary in effect too. So, um, so let's just walk through one one more example briefly to to illustrate your point that the if you start from a philosophic conception of value as objective, and you build an economic theory based on that, then you can actually describe and and, and give theoretical accounts for what actually happens in a market so you know something like uber coming along and then there's lyft and then there's wings and then there's you know a whole bunch of other um uh, people trying to move in and then the market so how, how does it account so just walk us through that process sure um you know i guess the key the, you know basically you, you, you could take neoclassical economics almost point for point and then you could take austrian economics and see how it's pretty much the opposite point for point um so neoclassical economics takes equilibrium as their analytical framework. Uh, Austrian economics takes the market process as their analytical framework. So, the, so for neoclassical economics, their chief subject matter is describing equilibrium, the equilibrium state of affairs. Um, for Austrian economics, their chief subject matter is describing this market process. And then what is this market process? Well, it's the process of you know, millions of individuals each with their own goals and constantly conceiving new goals, um, and then constantly creative think, creatively thinking of plans to achieve their goals, um, and uh, and this you know not just high level entrepreneurs, but right down to you know you and me and everybody you know we're constantly coming up with new goals, and new things to do, and new plans of how to do them and so on, and even on a very mundane level. Um, so you know Australian economics wants to describe well how does that process unfold. So there's no terminus point, there's no equilibrium, it's just this continually unfolding market process of people pursuing their goals and how does that integrate? So how, you know, the fact that we're each pursuing our goals and we're each engaging in production, but not for ourselves, for other people, you know, because we're producing things that we're gonna sell to other people. Um, how does that all integrate and come together into, you know, a somewhat unified economy that you have a division of labor that works, that, you know, that's integrated, it's not just, People randomly producing whatever they feel like, and then you know, who knows whether anybody wants to buy it. And so, so it's not the chaos of production that, uh, or the anarchy of production that Marx uh, trying to describe capitalism instead. It's this incredible unity, this incredible integration um, that arises uh, in a capitalist society. You know, it's not imposed. There's nobody in charge who says, "Hey, you know, here's the plan. You guys all do this, and that way you'll be integrated." You know, instead, it's each person doing his own thing, and yet it all comes together in this you know, incredible integration. Um, so that really becomes, for Austrian economics, the central subject matter of what they study and how that happens. Um, and uh, you know, I guess the central answer, at least for von Mises, who I, I view von Mises as being sort of the culmination of Austrian economics. He, he brings it to a full, consistent theoretical system. Um, he has his imperfections, but I would say you know, largely his theoretical system is... is is correct and brilliant. Um, you know, so the answer for him is economic calculation is the is the central process of how this all integrates and works. Is that uh, 
know, the price system gives us an array of prices. And then as we're each pursuing our goals, we look at this array of prices and try to figure out, well, how can we achieve value given our goals, given what we want and given this array of prices. And then it's, well, you come up with an idea. Oh, maybe I could do this. Okay. How do I get there? Okay. Let me try to creatively think of a plan. Okay. If I, I can buy this and do this and so on using these prices and then I can sell it over here for those prices. Um, and you know, the, because of the way the price system works, which economics describes, you know, that's what integrates everybody's activities into a unified whole. So if I'm, so if we can recreate the moment when someone had the idea for Uber, so you know they're frustrated by trying to flag a taxi down, and so for them this was there's, there's a problem with this market for transportation, and right. I and and I I have an idea for I you know, the person has. You know, if we can only coordinate with drivers on a smartphone, I wonder what that would take. And so he's, he's sort of forming a goal. This is the problem. Here's a goal. And there would be value because we could make it cheaper. Is that, I mean, is that a way to capture sort of some of the thinking? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's a good example. Yeah. And, then, and then somebody, so they launch Uber and then I don't know the timing, but let's say it's subsequent, then, then uh, Lyft comes along and says, oh, we think we can do this better than you. We can find the efficiencies that you know we can carve out this market in a new way, and yep. that's that's sort of the competition piece of it. That's right. Exactly. Yep. Yep. So it's, right. it's fascinating to think that um, so the these other economic schools of thought they have big known gaps in terms of their ability to explain things. Right. Right. That's right. Yeah, and and they know it. I think that's the funny thing is that. Um, a lot of them know that there are these gaps and they think that's a problem, but um, you know, they think it's just, well, that's for continued research. But I think what they don't realize is that given their fundamental philosophical premises, you know, given their subjective conception of value, they're never going to be able to solve that. You know, they're, they're just not focused on the right reference, on the right subject matter to ever be able to give a systematic explanation of, uh, of those things. So I want to turn now to relating Ayn Rand's conception of objective value and uh, the Austrian school, which so you, part of what I take from your essay is um, they agree on sort of in, in fundamental terms about what objective value looks like. Now, so if that's an accurate summary, you can tell me, but I want to understand, um, so what do they actually have in common? Where do they differ and how do they see each other? You know, so there's this whole question of, you mentioned really early in the conversation that there's a terminological confusion about the, the Austrians think of themselves as standing for a subjective value. Well, what does that really look like? So maybe you can help us unpack that. So first, sure. where do they agree? How do they differ? And then how do they see each other? Uh, sure. So I guess you know, what I argue in, in the chapter is that they, uh, they agree on a basic conception of objective value. So Ayn Rand explicitly originates this category of value. Um, the Austrians, I argue, implicitly have this category of value, um, but they call it subjective because they don't have this third category that Ayn Rand coins. So from their view, there's only two categories, intrinsic or subjective. But again, they, they call intrinsic objective, so you can get confusing to keep that straight. Is it when, when mainstream people say objective, they mean intrinsic. They don't mean Ayn Rand's mm -hmm. objective. Um, so they can, they, 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 call it subjective value, but what they really mean is that it, it's subject dependent. So not subjective in the sense that, oh, it's just a subjective feeling of pleasure or liking something, but subjective in the sense that it's, it's an individual subject who you know, has the value or does the goal-directed thinking and so on. Um, and that's what really separates Menger from Jevons and Valrock, so the three founders of or the three co-discoverers, I guess, of marginal value, which launched modern economics. Um, so Jevons and Barra were much more on the subjective value, you know, truly subjective value, that sub your value is just utility or pleasure or preference and so on. Um, whereas Menger, his, these very uh, interesting passages where he describes value that comes very close to how Ayn Rand's uh, conceives objective value. So for him, it is about a mind cognitively conceiving a goal and cognitively, uh, you know, integrating means towards a goal and so on. So he very much brings knowledge into this process of evaluating. 
Um, and that conceptual value is really what launches the Austrian school. And they've been you know, pretty much faithful to that implicit conception because the whole system is based on that implicit conception. Um, now what, what the problem is though is because they think they're subject to value, they call it subject to value. Over time, they've gradually started to erode mm. uh, concept of value. So you see this with Mises, for example. So he will say, yeah, value is subjective. He'll start to attribute it more to consumers. Uh, he has this idea of consumer sovereignty and so on. Um, and, uh, and he'll say, yeah, value is subjective. It's just whatever people feel like it is. So Ayn Rand will criticize him for all that and say, if that's wrong, she disagrees. Um, but you know, his implicit conception of value that infuses his economics is still objective value, I would argue. So it's still about goal-directed action. It's still about you know, people conceiving goals and creatively conceiving plans. Um, now, what's also interesting is that you know, von Mises recognized that to some extent. So he recognized okay, this idea of goal-directed action. Well, that's not value because value is subjective, he thinks. Um, so what is that? And then he started trying to think about it and conceptualize it philosophically. So he came up with the idea, well, there's a whole new science here that nobody's ever talked about, uh, the science of goal-directed action. And he called it praxeology. And so he said, okay, you know, this is what my economics is based upon and talks about is this, this activity of goal-directed action. Um, but nobody's conceptualized it before, so therefore I will, and I'm calling it praxeology. Um, Ayn Rand comes along and she, uh, in her marginalia, which is commenting on human action, she'll say, well, I mean, she's, she's writing for herself, so she can be quite sharp sometimes, but she'll say, isn't this just obviously ethics? Um, so for her, you know, that's the primary subject matter of ethics is goal-directed action, goal-directed thinking. And that's the crux of her object of conceptual value is, you know, it's conceiving goals and conceiving plans. So, um, you know, so by Mises had his finger on object of value, but he didn't know what to do with it because it didn't fit into the two known categories of value, intrinsic and subjective. So instead he coined praxeology to, to capture this. Um, so Ayn Rand criticized him for that as well. Um, but you know, none of that, you know, so that waters down Austrian economics to some extent and causes confusion and so on, but none of that negates the core of their economics. None of that in any way um, uh, it destroys their, their achievement with, uh, with their theoretical systems. And Ayn Rand was a fan of, of Austrian economics, of the economics, not, not the philosophy of, you know, the uh, philosophizing that von Mises was doing, definitely not the philosophizing that Hayek was doing. Um, but she was a fan of the economics and she thought it was great. And uh, in her newsletters, there were positive reviews of von Mises' books and so on. Um, so there was definitely a recognition of kinship for Ayn Rand's side with the Austrians. From the other side, um, you know, how did the Austrians see the connection with Ayn Rand? You know, I don't think they've ever grasped or taken seriously her philosophic ideas. So I think even going back to, you know, von Mises was a fan of that the Shrug. He even wrote a letter to Ayn Rand praising that the Shrug. Um, Hayek made a comment somewhere where he said he couldn't make head or tail of her ideas. Um, so I think to this day, she's kind of viewed as this uh, novelist. So she's a pro-capitalist novelist. Um, she's viewed that she um, you know, is great at illustrating and dramatizing pro-capitalist economics. Um, and she's great at attracting, she's great as an advocate, she's great at attracting people to, you know, pro-capitalist viewpoints and so on. But then I think it ends there. They don't really understand that there's anything deeper to her uh, than that. Um, so, which I think is a shame. I think if they understood, you know, what she has to offer in terms of philosophy, and especially the subjective conception of value, that it's, uh, that could go a long way to uh, provide a philosophic base for Austrian economics. And, uh, you're giving more support for, for capitalism, the proper way to defend capitalism. Well, that brings us to the, the book you contributed to, which I want to remind people about and encourage them to read it, Foundations of a Free Society. So your chapter starts the section, if I, if I remember correctly, on um, the interplay between philosophy and economics. Yep. And there's some chapters there. I think one of uh, contemporary Austrian, I think Pete Betke, is that fair to characterize in that way? Um, he's got a chapter in here, um, and then there's responses to it. So it's a really interesting um, sort of dialogue 
um, on these issues. But I, what I'm taking away from our conversation, which I, I found really interesting, is the two things. One is that Ayn Rand's philosophic contribution or philosophic argument for capitalism is really profound, and it, 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 I mean, it really ripples through an argument for capitalism. It isn't just this is a good system, but it actually, if I, if I, uh, you know, summarizing your, your case, it's, it provides the kind of foundation that an economic theory about capitalism would need to have. Yeah. Yeah. And, and just that there's so much more to learn, um, about, um, capitalism, why it's, why she had such a strong, uh, uh, position on it and sort of the, the foundation that she provides for it. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I think one issue is that the defenders of capitalism in particular, um, because they think that there is not a philosophical base, or a lot of times they want to ignore that there's a philosophical base. So ironically, it's often the enemies of capitalism that try to point out its philosophical base so they can attack it. Mm. Um, and then the defenders of capitalism want to ignore that that's there because they don't want to be attacked because they don't have any alternative philosophical base. Um, but I think if they understood Ayn Rand's philosophic base, then that would go a long way to being able to you know, understand capitalism and defend it properly. Um, so I mean, just one example is that, uh, you know, from Ayn Rand's perspective of objective value, it's very much the individualistic perspective uh, that she takes on economics. Um, but even a lot of defenders of capitalism do not reach that perspective. So instead, they try to defend capitalism from an aggregate viewpoint which she would call the tribal viewpoint and say, well, capitalism, you know, maximizes utility or capitalism uh, gives the best outcomes for the most people or, or things like that. Um, and those arguments tend to fail uh, just because people know that capitalism doesn't, on whatever standards, they'll have all kinds of different standards, whether it's environmental or it's altruistic or no, no, this outcome is actually bad and capitalism produces that. So therefore capitalism is bad. Um, so, but and then the defenders of capitalism have no response to that. So, you know, they can't fight on an aggregate level and say this aggregate outcome's good, and this, you know, and then the enemies come along and say no, that's bad, and there's just no way for defenders to answer that. So, well, thanks for your contribution to this book. I found it really enlightening, and, um, and this is one more plug for everyone to pick up a copy of Foundations of a Free Society. Reflections on Ayn Rand's political philosophy and the editors are Greg Salmieri and Robert Mayhew. Uh, thanks for your time, Rob. I really appreciate our conversation today. Yeah, no problem. Thanks very much, Elon.